A pediatric infectious disease doctor gets to take care of children who have infectious diseases. Now those are things like uh, the common cold or maybe something more serious like pneumonia or meningitis or anything that might uh, require the special um, expertise of a pediatric infectious disease doctor. I also get to be a pediatrician. I get to teach people, so I get to teach the, the um, residents, so the doctors who are becoming uh, pediatricians and medical students and other pediatricians and nurses. So I get to tell them about things like vaccines um, and how we prevent infectious diseases. My new role is the Special Advisor to the Commissioner of Health of New Jersey. And that's a wonderful role because what I'm really doing right now is talking about COVID-19 vaccine and how do we get it to everybody in New Jersey. So it's very difficult to make sure that we're getting the vaccine to everybody who needs it and that we're telling people and educating them about the vaccine, about its side effects, where it has side effects, but also about the importance of protecting themselves. So the most fun about being a pediatric infectious disease doctor is getting to take care of children. And it's especially nice watching children and teenagers get better from their infections. So most of the infections that I deal with are very treatable and children recover completely. And that's a wonderful thing to watch. As far as in public health, I think the wonderful thing there is instead of taking care of one child, you actually have the ability to have an impact on everyone who lives in New Jersey. So we can really reach out to everyone and tell them how they can be healthier, how they can protect themselves, what can they do to ensure that they're as well as they can be and their ch children are as well as they can be. When you're dealing with a child with an infection and they've been sent to you to try to figure out what exactly is wrong, it's very challenging if you can't figure it out. It's very challenging if there isn't an answer or if things don't fit together. So I think that's the most challenging is not knowing what's wrong with someone um, and not knowing exactly what we can do to try to make them get better. From the public health standpoint, the most challenging thing is that things take longer than you want them to take. So you get a great idea and you think, oh, we could do this, we could do that, but it's gotta go through the right channels. You have to make sure that there aren't unanticipated uh, consequences of your great idea. So that having to go through and really make sure, you know, kind of slows you down and, and you think, boy, I'd really like to get this done. I really appreciate everything I've been taught, even going back to kindergarten. So what you learn in kindergarten is how to get along with other people. And that is absolutely essential if you want to be a good doctor. You also, as you're going through school, learn how to talk to other people, how to get along with them, how to, to make sure that they understand what it is you're trying to say. So that social interaction is just so important and so critical. And to me, that's one of the saddest things that our children have lost during this past year when they couldn't go to school and they couldn't be in person. Because that learning, that learning how to get along with your peers and your, and your, your teachers and you know, the kids below you, all of that is critically important for how we conduct ourselves when we become adults. And then all the stuff they taught me. So the math, I need math all the time to figure out doses, to make sure that the child's getting the right medicine, not too much of it, but enough of it. I need writing. I need writing to, to record in a chart in a, in a way that another person can understand what I found. So I have to be clear with what the findings were so that putting words together makes a, it makes a lot of sense. And it's, it's really something I, I really appreciate. And then I've also had the opportunity to do some research. And when you do that research, you wanna share those results with other people and you have to know how to write it up in a way that other people will understand what you did. So you write it, you rewrite it, etc. 
And then we also do things like writing review articles or writing articles to help other doctors understand what the new guidelines are for something or how they ought to be doing some kind of care. So writing is absolutely important and we need to have those simple things like grammar. If you're not writing in a way that people can understand what you're saying, it's not going to be particularly helpful. And then technology. Oh my goodness, in healthcare, technology has gone through the roof. So there's a few things that I still have from 1975 that I can use, like my stethoscope. That hasn't changed so much. But boy, all the other things, the imaging things. I mean, back when I started, yeah, we did x-rays part of the day. We didn't even do them at night. But now it's not just x-rays. You can do all kinds of imaging from computerized tomography, the so-called CAT scans, to magnetic resonance imaging, MRIs. So we really can get a picture of what's going on inside someone without having to open them up and look in that way. So this looking through and being able to see things. And then even the things like ultrasound. Everybody's heard of the Doppler effect, so people, you can ultrasound the heart to see how it's working. For pregnant women, you can ultrasound the developing baby see how the baby's doing, Are there any, is there any evidence of problems with the baby? So these things have really, really revolutionized uh, medicine. So, so if you started in 75 like I did, you, you don't even recognize a lot of the things that are happening now. And it's not just imaging, it's also like diagnostic tests. You know, so before we could take a culture, like a throat culture when someone has a sore throat, and you take it to the laboratory and put it on a plate, well, now there are all kinds of other ways that you can find out which bacteria is causing a problem. We have these things called PCRs, polymerase chain reaction tests. So we can find out what a person, what um, germs a person has in them that in the past, we, we never could have figured that out. But now we can tell which virus you're infected with, which bacteria you might have. And that really helps to guide our, our treatment. And even in treatment, technology has helped because we have a lot of different ways, not only in pediatrics, but in surgery. So now a lot of things are done with robotic surgery to assist you. So instead of just relying on, on how good your hands are, you have a robot to help you. Or you have, uh, you know, like the, like the kids now do in the video games. I mean, you, you can do that kind of technology and really ensure that you get the best outcomes. So I'd say I've used pretty much everything I, I learned. There's a lot of things I wish I had learned better. I wish that I had taken my Spanish class seriously. Boy, would I ever love to be able to speak Spanish. Not only well, fluently would be ideal, but if I could at least understand it. Um, when you're dealing with patients and they don't speak your language, it's very, very difficult to, um, to, to make the same kind of connection. And yes, we use all kinds of translators now, we use video translation, but it's still, it, it's still relying on someone else to tell them what I would like to be able to talk to them with. So we know that when people can talk to you in your own language, that it's, it's a much better fit and you may get a much better story. So I sincerely wish that I had taken languages more seriously and that I had actually learned how to speak Spanish instead of all I can say is albondigas, which is meatballs for crying out loud. So, so that part. And then there's one skill that I don't know that I learned it during school, but I've, I learned it um, kind of on the job. And that skill, which is really, really important, is the art of listening. So we're very good at talking and we're very good at interrupting our patients. And they actually did a study where they showed that doctors routinely interrupt their patients after about seven seconds. So we don't, we don't give our patients a chance to tell us their story. So we should not only listen and hear what they're saying, but the art of actively listening is really allowing them to tell us their stories to, and tell it in their words so that we can understand the impact of what's happening with them what's happening to their lives, to their children, and talking to children is also an art. And again, listening, because it's very easy to talk at people, but that act of listening 
is really, I think, the key to communication, and communication is the key to good medicine. So the first thing I'd say is, go for it. We need more healthcare workers. And the great news about healthcare is almost anything that you're interested in, we can find a way to make that work for you. So we have people in healthcare who are doing, we have obviously doctors like myself, we have the nurses, we have a physician's assistants, we have occupational therapists, physical therapists, then we have the technologists, the people who work in, in uh, radiology, who work with the imaging, make sure that, the, that they come out right and they position the patient right and they, they uh, talk to the patients and they do all that kind of stuff. Then we have all the people who work in the labs, who run all the blood tests and the microbiology tests. So whatever you're interested in science, there's a place for you in medicine. And if you're interested in research, I was listening to a story on my way here about uh, cancer therapies and new cancer therapies. People are, are working on ways to take your own blood cells and help them learn how to fight cancers. And that kind of uh, new ideas, that innovation is, is just remarkable. And there's a place for anyone who's interested in that. 